Howdy folks. My name is Miss Sinclair and this is Miss Sinclair's history class. Today, we are going to continue talking about APUSH, AP US history. Currently, we are in period two, looking at topic 2.3. Now we started talking about 2.3 last time by digging into Jamestown and the early Chesapeake colonies. We also talked a little bit about Maryland um, and Delaware as well. Today we're digging into the New England colonies. Now, if you are new to my channel, to, you should know that there are a couple places where you can get this information. One is on YouTube, watch the videos, get the PowerPoint. But if you just want the audio, you can find the same lecture as a podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. What you get right now is the same thing that my students would get in the classroom. I'm just an ordinary high school teacher. So if you are a student who's missed class, a teacher who's prepping for class, or just someone who wants to know what are the kids learning these days in US history, welcome. I'm glad you're here. But enough of me talking, let's dig into the content. So we are going to be looking at topic 2.3, looking at the New England colonies. The New England colonies are going to be different in nature to the Jamestown colonies. So I think it is helpful to begin by trying to remember a little bit about Jamestown. So what were the challenges facing Jamestown? What made the Jamestown experience unique? You might be thinking, I don't remember. Like that was a while ago. I don't know, it, it wasn't New England, it was Virginia, I guess. If you find yourself struggling to answer little review questions like this, use this as a clue to track your own learning, right? If, if you can't remember what your teacher went over in class yesterday, how do you expect to remember it two weeks from now on the test or in May on the AP test? Use this as a little clue to tell you, all right, I need to do a little bit more studying. So often students think, I went to class, I took notes during class, good enough but the information in class often comes like through the eyes and out the pencil, right? It doesn't actually stick in your brain. So you may consider reading over your notes in the evening or summarizing them or making flashcards, just food for thought. So what were some of the challenges facing Jamestown? You know, there was famine, there was bad placement, John Smith had to come in. We're gonna see different challenges facing New England. So our objective today is you will be able to explain how and why environmental and other factors shaped the, the development and expansion of the New England colonies. Okay, now when you think New England colonies, most people think Puritans, pilgrims, which is not incorrect. But to really understand the choices that the Puritans make in regards to how they structure their society, what they value, you have to understand a little bit of Christian theology. Now, you might be thinking, this isn't world history, or this isn't a religious class. This is AP US history. Why does any of this matter? Well, it matters to us as scholars, as historians, because it mattered to the Puritans, right? It would be like trying to understand the values of the ancient Egyptians without knowing their belief system or understand the value, values and choices of the Ottomans or the Abbasid Caliphate without knowing anything about Islam, right? So context matters, right? Um, what is history without context? It's a bunch of random facts. So bear with me. You don't need to write this stuff down if you're taking notes, but it is helpful context. So Protestant theology. Let me take things back a couple more steps before I jump into theology. Um, Protestants um, are a branch of Christianity. So there are generally three branches of Christianity. There's 
the Roman Catholic Church, I think the Pope. There's the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then there's the Protestant Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is sort of one large entity, right? It's led by the Pope. It's governed from the Vatican in Rome. The Eastern Orthodox Church is somewhat hierarchical, but it has, still has multiple denominations within it. So you might hear about the Russian Orthodox Church or the Syrian Orthodox Church or the Antioch Orthodox Church or Greek Orthodox, right? And their priests can get married. They are led by a patriarch who is sort of the head of their religious order. And then finally you have Protestants. The Protestant church is much less hierarchical. And in fact, it splinters into a bunch of different denominations. So Lutherans, Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, you know, non-denominational churches. These are all Protestant churches, Methodists, um, American Methodist Episcopal churches, right? These are all Protestant denominations. So before I talk about the Protestant Reformation, I'm going to give us a little bit of context of that. Let's stick with theology. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and it was good, right? Like that's opening lines of the Bible. A lot of people can recognize that. You'll hear it referenced in books and movies and comic books, right? This is, this is a recognizable concept. So Protestants believe that God creates a perfect world. Perfect, right? You never get a hangnail, right? You never um, will be hungry. Um, you never step on a thorn, right? It's life is perfect. It's always 75 and sunny with a nice breeze. And the nature of this God is significant, right? You might learn about Roman gods or Greek gods, right? Zeus was capricious. He cheated on his wife. He lied. He slept with ladies. He had a bunch of kids, right? He acted like a human in many ways. You might hear about other gods who required sacrifices, right? We know that the Aztec gods required sacrifices to appease them, to get their goodwill. Well, the god of Christianity and this is the same sort of this origin story would also work for all of our Abrahamic religions, meaning Judaism and Islam as well. So this God is much more abstract, right? He is all knowing, all powerful, all loving, and always just. What does that mean? That means he demands justice. And we use he pronouns, uh, he, him pronouns when we talk about God, because that's how the Bible describes him. So we're just honoring the source material. <laughs> That's how God talks about himself. He chose his pronouns. So um, what does that mean? Well, it means God knows everything, right? God knows about the little lie you told. He knows about the kid being abused in secret to the evil plans being made. Um, he knows what happened in the past, the true story of what happened. And he knows what's going to happen in the future. God's all powerful, which means he can do whatever he wants, right? He could get rid of gravity if he wanted to. Um, and he's always loving. That means he wants what's good for his people. But he's always just. So we want justice, right? Even a four-year-old understands the concept of justice. Perhaps you have said these words. That's just not fair. That's not fair. Why is it that my younger sister gets a cell phone at the same time I do, even though I had to wait till I was 13 and she's 10. That's not fair. She should have to wait three more years, right? If we desire justice, we see something evil happens and we're like, that's not right. The, um, someone gets rich by um, exploiting others. We say, that's not right. Someone gets power through murder. That's not right, right? We desire justice. Well, Protestants believe that God is just, that he has a set of rules and he will honor these rules. All right, the problem is sin has entered the world, right? The, the world is broken, right? This is called the fall. Um, and again, right, Protestants would say, look around the world, right? There's hunger, there's starvation, there's famine, there's climate change, right? There are 
politicians who lie. There are parents who abandon their children. There's genocide and rape and greed. And the world just kind of sucks, right? We look around and we're like, perfect world, um, where? Well, Protestants would say this is because of sin. This is because evil has entered the world. And the flip side of that is sin has entered humans on a genetic level, basically. Like there's no way humans can be good enough to meet God's standard, right? We're going to lie. We're going to steal. We're going to cheat on a quiz. We're going to be bratty and rude to someone who loves us because we're just in a bad mood and we know we can take it out on our mom and she's not going to, you know, she still has to love us or our friend or, you know, whatever it might be. Well, you might think, no, but that's not that bad, right? God should let, just let that little one slide. Well, if you want God to be just on the big things, he should be just in all things. Otherwise he's inconsistent, right? That would be the Protestant answer. Therefore, all humans are doomed to hell, right? We humans can't be good enough to earn salvation according to God's standard, which is so high. Therefore humanity is doomed. And you might think this sucks. This system doesn't seem to work. Well, Protestants would say, aha, this is where Jesus comes in, right? If you know anything about Christianity, you've probably heard the name Jesus. So Jesus is the son of God. And I'm sorry, this is taking a while, but just if you have a solid foundation for Protestant theology, it will help under, you understand American history. Um, Jesus is a son of God. He is sinless, but also human, right? So he's the only human who can meet God's standard. Well, he is unjustly killed, right? He has done nothing to deserve um, punishment. And because of that, he essentially acts as the theological word is propitiation, right? He acts as the replacement for human sin, thus giving humanity a way in, right? It's like, uh, it's like let's say um, you... Um, you cheat on a test and your teacher catches you and you're going to get in trouble. Um, and I, who did nothing wrong, I studied for the test. I step in and say, I'll, I'll take the punishment. I'll take the zero on the test. Um, and so even though I didn't do anything wrong, I took I'm the one who's going to fail the test and take the punishment and you get my grade, you get hundred percent, right? That's sort of the idea here. And because of that, Jesus comes back to life, right? He, he dies and is resurrected, goes into heaven, is coming back. Okay, so to wrap this up, to be saved, right? To be part of the new world, right? Jesus is coming back someday and everything will be made perfect. We're back to that perfect creation. There will, like dodo birds will be coming back, right? Um, there will be no pain, there will be no hunger. Everything will be perfect, if you want to be there, right? if you want to come back to life and be part of that, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to admit that you can't save yourself and you have to believe in Jesus. And how do we know what God wants? How do we know how to live in a way that pleases God and Jesus? You read the Bible. Okay. I know that was quite the information dump. Just hold that in your head, just loosely, right? You didn't have to write any of that down. All right, let's talk about Puritanism now that you have that foundation. So I mentioned the Roman Catholic Church. For much of world history, um, the Roman Catholic Church was the main arbitrator, arbitrator, can I use that word right? Um, the main um, authority of Christianity, right? The Pope decides what is sin and what is not sin. And Catholic theology believes that to receive God's grace, to be saved, right? To make sure you're part of the new creation, to be saved from damnation. Catholic theology says you have to do a few things to receive that grace. You need to pray. You need to be baptized. You need to be confirmed. You need to confess your sins. You need to do X, Y, and Z. Well, in 1517, a German monk named Martin Luther is like, no, you don't. He, he reads the Bible and his interpretation of the text, this is why you need to go to your sources, right? God, know your primary sources. Um, 
he says, no, the Bible doesn't actually say that. And this idea takes off. Now, Europeans generally were pretty dissatisfied with the Catholic Church. Um, by 1517, you had the excesses of the Pope during the Renaissance. Um, you have indulgences. You have the fact that the church couldn't prevent the Black Death. And then you have this power struggle. So there's this whole political aspect of it as well. So the Pope, since he is the spiritual authority of Europe, also ended up be having a lot of political power as well, right? If you wanted to be king of France, you had to get on your knees before the Pope. And the Pope was like, yes, I ordain you king of France. You have been chosen by God, blah, blah, blah. And it means if you piss off the Pope, he can be like, no, I take that back. God has not chosen you to be king of France. God has chosen this other guy. And suddenly like you're up a creek without a paddle. And also your soul is damned to hell for eternity. So. If this Martin Luther guy is right, then we don't have to listen to the Pope. We can do what we want. We can do what we want with that money. It's this idea of how are you saved? Are you saved through grace by faith, right? Martin Luther would say, all you have to do is believe. Just believe in Jesus, right? Then that's the only thing you have to do. Or are you saved through works? Do you have to take action, right? Baptisms, et cetera, et cetera. Well, another Protestant theologian and the one who is significant to the Puritans is a guy named John Calvin. Now, John Calvin says, look, if, if God knows everything, God knows who's going to be saved. God knows how the story ends, who's going to heaven and going to be part of the new creation and who's going to hell, right? Um, the Reformed theology refers to this sometimes as predestination and the people who are saved are the elect, right? So since God is all powerful, everything is predetermined. He knows the his how history is going to go. Um, so let's see, do I have Henry? Okay. A little bit more context guys. Hold, just bear with me. Trust me. All right. So how does this refer to England? Well, remember I talked about the political aspect of it. Well, England was Catholic like the rest of Europe until it had a king named Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII is a pretty famous guy. You may have heard his name before. Henry was not supposed to originally be king. His brother was going to be king. And his brother was married to the young Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon. They get married, brother goes off to war, gets killed. So now Henry VIII is king and it'd be really helpful to hold on to this alliance with Spain. So he writes to Pope and he's like, dear Pope, I would like to please, please, please be married to my brother's widow. And the Pope is like, uh, I'm not so sure. Like technically you guys are brother and sister, right? Because she was your brother's wife. That makes her your sister-in-law. Like that's kind of skeevy. And he's like, no, 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 don't worry. Like she told me they never had sex. And so like, it's fine. It's not weird. Um, and the Pope's like, okay, okay, sure. You guys are young, whatever. Okay. They go on to have one child, a daughter and Henry waits. And Catherine's not having any other kids, no sons. And he needs a son. Enter this beautiful young woman named Anne Boleyn who quickly becomes Henry's mistress. So it'd be really convenient if he could ditch Catherine, who's old now, and marry young Anne Boleyn, because she could probably get pregnant, right? So he writes to Pope, dear Pope, I would like to divorce Catherine and marry Anne. I mean, it's kind of weird marrying my sister-in-law anyway. And the Pope is like, no, no, are you kidding me? You already asked for a special favor to marry Catherine in the first place. I'm not letting you divorce Catherine um, so you can marry your side chick. Like, come on, man. Henry's pretty peeved about that until he realizes, aha, there's this whole Protestant thing happening. And if we're Protestant, then we don't have to listen to the Pope. So he's like, boom, uh, England is Protestant now. We are Anglican and I'm in charge. I'm the head of the Anglican church. So the church of England is the Anglican church. Now, 
to give credit where credit's due, right? The English Reformation has real theological bones to it. Um, there's, it's not all just Henry wanting to get laid, but it's a little bit of Henry wanting to get laid. So the Anglican church is going to be the main religious authority in England. Now, because the inciting incident that led to the creation of the Anglican church was a political one more than a theological one, it means that in many ways, the Anglican church is Catholic light. They are still wearing the robes. They have the incense. They have the candles and cathedrals and stained glass and bishops and archbishops. And some Protestants in England say, that's not good enough, right? You guys are still too Catholic, right? Like we got to go all in on this Protestantism, right? John Calvin says predestination. And if you want to make sure you're part of the elect, you need to make sure you are living in a way that honors God. And Anglicans, I don't think you are. So the Puritans wanted to purify the Anglican church. The pilgrims said it, there's no saving it, right? The Anglican church is doomed. Therefore, we're getting out of Dodge, right? Um, in England, they were not allowed to practice their faith, um, which was not part of the Anglican tradition, right? Um, so they're going to go to the uh, to Holland to, the, uh, to be with the Dutch and realize, well, this isn't what we want either. So they're going to decide to go to the new world. All right. Now I really want to start taking notes. If you think about some of the other push factors, pushing people to the new world, there are economic issues, right? By this point, we had a depression in the wool industry. Um, economically, we had crazy inflation thanks to Spanish silver coming over from the new world. There was a malaria outbreak near London. And in general, thanks to the new food coming from the new world in the form of maize and potatoes, you had a huge population boom. And it would be very convenient for England to get rid of some of these people off the island. So we see that the pilgrims, these separatists, right? Remember, Puritans want to purify the Anglican church. Pilgrims just want to ditch it. So the pilgrims decide to settle in the new world. They sail over on a boat known as the Mayflower. And while on the Mayflower, they write what is known as the Mayflower Compact. It is known as the first constitution in the new world. It's a social contract. You have the authority, um, like you're governing with the consent of the governed, right? If, if you, you should read it, right? It's a primary source that shows up often on the AP tests and in SAQs and DBQs. Um, and it's not very long. But it says that um, the authority will make their own rules with majority rule. They still say, look, we honor the king, but we're going to be the ones making our rules. They're aiming for Virginia. Uh, or sorry, like Virginia, they have a really difficult first wind, uh, winter. They did not anticipate landing in Massachusetts. Now, they have a high mortality rate, half died, but hard work pays off. And one of the differences between the New England colonists and the Virginia colonists is going to be the fact that the Puritans and the Pilgrims will come over as families, right? In Virginia, it was a bunch of single men and it, this, that's gonna cause problems, right? They're gonna be like, we need some ladies here. Um, from the get-go, it's families. It's married couples with children. And one of the things that they are going to do is they will interact with the native peoples there. So perhaps you've heard of the Native American man, Squanto. He knew English because he had been kidnapped by the British and had traveled all over the world as kind of a novelty, right? Look at what we caught. It's like if you caught a bear, right? Or a bird in New Guinea. It's tragic that a human being was treated so cavalierly. Now, by this point, 
Native Americans in New England had contact with British, Dutch, French traders. It's not like um, the pilgrims arrive and Native Americans wander out from the trees and are like, oh, I've never seen a white man before. No, they did business with Europeans all the time. And in fact, they, um, they thought Europeans were pretty gross, right? Native Americans um, bathed uh, on a daily basis. They kept themselves clean shaven. Um, they really took care of their personal hygiene and their appearance. And then they come across these Europeans who shaved like never, who bathed maybe once a year um, with terrible breath and just thought, thought they were the grossest people and they would not be wrong. They sounded disgusting. So Squanto is of the Massaoit tribe, and he is going to help the pilgrims, right? He will assist them, teaching them where to plant, the best place to settle, and families will flourish, right? So um, in 1621, you have sort of the first Thanksgiving, which is simply to celebrate the fact that they survived. They survived the first year. William... Um, Bradford will be our first pilgrim governor, right? They, um, the pilgrim's mission is to set up a government um, as sort of agents of God. They are divinely inspired. They are going to use language, biblical language. Um, like this is, they took an exodus, like Moses. Um, they're creating, this is the new Cana. They're settling the land. Um, this is the new holy land. Um, Bradford is um, going to set the tone for New England. Um, it's not just gonna be economic gain. Like Jamestown is designed specifically to let's make that money, right? If we can't find gold, we'll grow it in the form of tobacco. Really New England from the get-go wants to create a life. They want to create a haven. So this is what I mean, why you need to understand a little bit about Christian theology, because it is their motivation for settling. It's their motivation for creating lands and communities, right? They're not just here to exploit and make money. They're here to evangelize, to create a community based off Christian values. Jonathan Winthrop, um, is going to give a very famous speech where he calls the Puritan community, right? This pilgrim community, a uh, city on a hill, which is um, biblical language, right? We will be a city on a hill, the new Jerusalem. And this is going to be in contrast to the Anglican church, right? Who um, they view as highly problematic. The pilgrims will be the first people to really call themselves Americans. And um, by 1640, I mean, between 1630 and 1640, over 10,000 um, Puritans um, will migrate over. So you have the pilgrims and you also have the Puritans. Um, if you were in my class, we would take a moment to read the Mayflower Compact and analyze it. Um, I'm not going to read it out loud to you. If you're watching this video, you'll see the text of the Mayflower Compact on your screen. I would encourage you to read it. Ask yourself, okay, what is it being, what's being said here? Can I summarize this document in like three sentences? Do I understand what is in front of me? Primary source analysis is incredibly important in APUSH. Your multiple choice questions will have a source. It might have an excerpt from the Mayflower Compact, and you will be expected to read that document, be able to place it in its historical context, and then answer questions that require critical thinking. It's not just, um, who wrote the Mayflower Compact? A, the Pilgrims. B, the Catholics. C, the French. D, the Indians. No. Like you have to actually understand what the text is saying. There's also a great video. Um, PBS came out with a series on the pilgrims um, and it's helpful to sort of have a visualization of their arrival. If you go to my YouTube channel and you look in the A push period two um, video playlist, you can find this as well as all the videos I show in class. All right, so I have a question for you. 
you will often hear the word Puritan thrown around. Ugh, that person's so puritanical. American culture is so puritanical. Great. What does that mean? If someone is described as puritanical, what does that mean? Well, it often means someone is kind of a stick in the mud, right? They're really conservative. They are really legalistic. They stick by the rules no matter what. Um, they're kind of just like a bummer all around, right? Um, and um, unfair, unjust, right? It's, it's not in a positive connotation. Uh, but the Puritans do offer a lot that is positive to American history. So let's talk about the Puritan family. Like all of our English families, they are very patriarchal. So that means the father is in charge of the family. However, because they are Calvinist, right? Because they place such a high value on their faith. And how do you know God? Well, you know God through the Bible. So the Puritans highly value education, right? Women knew how to read. Women read the Bible. They um, were educated and they were also very fertile. So um, we'll talk about the kids in a second. We would see that in New England, um, complex kinship relations would develop with nearby towns. So what does that mean? It means um, I, if I'm from Tucson, right, I might marry a guy from Oracle or Casa Grande or Phoenix, and that would link our communities together, right? Marriages were agreements on both sides. We're not talking arranged marriages here where it's like, ah, you will marry my daughter and I, in return, uh, we will link this land together. There's enough land to go around, right? And so it's, it's you know, do them. Does the young man and the young woman want to marry each other? Um, as land starts to get grabbed up, right, as more and more people settle, as um, families expand, we start to see young couples postponing marriage. Um, it's not uncommon to what you see today, right? People are like, I don't want to get married until I am done with my education and I have a little bit of a nest egg, um, Marriages in Puritan New England are based off love, right? Love is highly valued. You might look at um, some of the poetry of Anne Bradstreet, who was the first poet and first female writer in New England. Um, we see that women took a large role as wife and mother. Um, everyone got married, there was a few spinsters. And what was your job as a Puritan mother? Go to church attend and participate in town meetings, but you could not hold government office, but your input was valued. Um, your domestic duties around the house, feeding the kids, making socks, et cetera, et cetera, and have lots and lots of kids. Now, it wasn't so much that, um, like these children are valued. There's no birth control. And so breastfeeding, um, can act as a deterrent to pregnancy because it can slow ovulation, but breastfeeding is not birth control, right? Like you can get pregnant while breastfeeding just for the record. Sometimes people get confused. So women tended to be pregnant about every two years during their fertile years. So they had on average about seven to 10 kids, huge families. And you know, it's the remarkable thing. Most of these kids live to adulthood. Right. In England, people might be having a lot of kids, but most of them are dying. Right. It'd be amazing if you have three kids live to adulthood out of your 10. You have clean air. You have less pollution, a better food supply, clean water. Right. There's no cholera here. We're not living in London. Children are living to adulthood and are going on to have 10 kids of their own. We know the importance of education in the Puritan household. You've got to be able to read the Bible for so both. Boys and girls will be educated. Boys admittedly will be educated more, but it's not like girls are being deprived of the ability to read and write. All right, so what about children? What's their attitude towards kids? Well, in many ways, kids are kind of viewed as a unit of production. 
this idea of like children as being cherished, as being treated differently, right? You now hear people be like, oh, our kids are growing up too fast. We want to preserve this influence. There's, you need to have more play. You need to have more free time. This is a really modern idea. Like 20th century, Dr. Spock on 1960s. Sure, with Rousseau in the Enlightenment, we'll start to change attitudes towards children. But for a lot of human history, A, chances that your child is going to survive are pretty slim. Um, so that means like you don't necessarily get super attached right away, right? In Korean culture, they have a huge celebration um, at the 100 day mark. Your baby has survived for 100 days. That means that they're probably going to make it. Um, so Puritan children were expected to pull their weight. Now, it's not like you're sending a two-year-old out there to thresh the wheat, but a two-year-old can collect eggs. A five-year-old can help milk the cow. Um, a seven-year-old can help churn butter. Think about how much work it would take to just live day-to-day -day life. You have to milk the cow. You are growing all your own food. You are taking the wool from the sheep, shearing it from the sheep, cleaning it, um, working it, making it into yarn um, or thread, and then weaving it into cloth to have new clothes, right? Um, it takes a lot of work. And so having the extra help is really helpful. So children should not be willful. They should be obedient. Um, remember, Puritans work off of this belief, this Protestant belief that sin is everywhere, right? Children are not inherently good because they're kids. Have you ever been around a toddler? They're throwing tantrums when they don't get their way. Like they are inherently selfish. They don't want to share. Um, Puritans interpret this as like, look, there's, it's just their sin nature coming out, right? Um, humans are just all stained by sin. We can't escape it. So we as parents, Puritan parents need to raise our children up so that they know the Lord. That means they are obedient, right? Um, one author describes kids as like angelic vipers. Um, so Anne Bradstreet, early Puritan poet, she writes in the book, Children, or not book, in the poem, Children, I had eight birds hatched in one nest, four males there were, and hens the rest. I nursed them up with pain and care, nor cost nor labor did I spare, till at last they felt their wing, mounted the trees and learned to sing. Chief of the brood then took his flight to regions far and left me quite. My mournful chirps I after send, till he return or I do end right? It's not just parents viewed kids as little sin machines that they could put to work and shows that this love and affection that they valued in marriage, they also valued in their family. They loved their kids. All right. What about government? We know that in Virginia, they had the house of Burgesses. Well, what kind of government did they have in New England? Well, as the Virgin, um, New England colony grows, um, we are going to start to see a shift, right? The Mass Massachusetts Bay Company will be founded in 1630, right? In 1629, King Charles gave the Puritans the right to settle and govern a colony in the Massachusetts Bay area. The colony established political freedom and a representative government. So in Virginia, you had like 90% suffrage. Remember, in England, you just had to have three acres to vote. Well, three acres is nothing in the new world. So 90% of um, New England men could vote. The general court was the term that they used to talk about their government. It's like the equivalent of the House of Burgesses. So it was made up of the House of Assistants, which is kind of like the Senate, and then the House of Deputies, which was kind of like 
the House of Representatives. So this is very similar to Virginia's House of Burgesses. <clears throat> the Puritans were known as Congregationalists and would refer to themselves, you know, Christians would be referred to as saints. Now don't think Mother Teresa or Saint Augustine or, um, you know, something like that. Um, the Bible describes all believers as saints. That's just a word used to it. So they have um, this covenant of grace, which means um, this is the agreement with God that you will be saved. And in the congregational church, you have a pastor, but then you have your parishioners, right? The congregation, the members, and they would get to participate in decision-making. So it's not like the Anglican church. And it's not like the Catholic church where you have the priest who makes all the decisions. In a congregational church, you are participating, right? You gained membership um, based off a, um, what's the word I want? Your testimony of faith. And then um, you would be part of electing your minister um, and all that jazz. All right, sorry, I went backwards. All right, there's a very silly video um, called Puritan Faith. You can find it on YouTube. It is a parody of George Michael's song, Faith, except it's about the Puritans. Um, all right, after 1660, we have three problems. Um, the first one is a social problem. Ooh. We're finding that a lot of our Puritan kids aren't quite living up to their parents' standards right? Um, parents aren't confident that their kids have really been able to pass the test of salvation. How do you know that you're part of the elect, that you are predestined to go to heaven? Well, you, you know, sort of pass a test in front of your church. Um, you have to answer questions, talk about your um, sort of testimony about how you came to faith in God. And these kids are not able to pass. They have a uh, we see that time has dampened zeal as one Puritan describes it. There's simply less religious fervor. So this is really problematic, right? Um, what they do in many ways is essentially lower the standard. It's called the halfway covenant. In the halfway covenant, which is going to be established in 1662, um, members and their children um, could be baptized, right? So their kids became sort of partial members. They could be baptized, they could take communion, or um, they uh, had to follow the creed, but until they were able to sort of demonstrate um, that they had fully, say, um, fully placed their faith in God, um, they could not vote in the congregation or take communion. There's sort of two interpretations of this um, by different Puritans. Um, there's Rigglesworth and Sewell. Um, they have a different critique of this, right? Um, Wigglesworth um, is against it, and he's going to write scary poetry for children to make them become better church members. Sewell, though, shows you know, that we should make it more accessible for kids. And Sewell is really the way that they're going to go. We also have ideological pressures. So we, if you think Puritan land, you probably think Virginia. Nope, I'm sorry, I misspoke. If you think Puritan land, you think Massachusetts. But um, we see other colonies emerging as well in New England. So let's start with Roger Williams. Roger Williams is known as an antimonium, right? Um, he's like the ultimate Puritan. Uh, and an inscrutable God tests us, right? He believes that the Church of England was morally corrupt. And he's also going to believe in religious freedom, right? Um, that there should be a separation between church and state. So he's going to be kicked out of um, Massachusetts because of these heretical views. Um, and he will buy land from Native Americans, right? He's not just taking it. Um, he's 
negotiating and buying the land. He will found Rhode Island and um, Connecticut will be formed as well um, out of some of this land. So what's Roger William, what's Rhode Island gonna look like um, in Connecticut? Well, you'll see a separation of church and state and religious freedom, right? There's no compulsory church worship. Faith alone is enough to go to heaven. Who cares if you go to church, right? That's Roger Williams' take. Um, Jews are allowed to be here, Catholics too, right? This is the only place in the England English colony so far that Jews can be. Um, we also have Anne Hutchinson. She's another problematic um, Puritan for um, the general court. Anne Hutchinson is going to speak out and criticize Puritan theology and leadership. Um, she illustrates this sort of Puritan contradiction, right? Puritans will firmly believe a thousand percent you are saved by grace, not works, right? You, you ask a question, um, how are you saved? By grace, not works. Boom. Okay. Well, if I'm just saved by grace through faith, why do I have to do this other stuff? Why do I have to take a test to prove my faith in front of the congregational church? Why do I need to take all these steps and um, do X, Y, and Z? She had heard the English preacher, John Cotton, preach and believed in his free grace theology that the gift of eternal life is free. All you have to do is believe in Jesus, right? There's nothing else you need to do. Well, the fact that she challenges the tension of like, no, like you have to go to church in this way and you have to do this and you have to do that. And you have to um, like pass the test and then halfway cup, like all these things. Um, she is going to be kicked out again by John Winthrop, um, first governor. Um, and she will be expelled from Massachusetts with all 14 of her children. Oh my gosh, so many kids and her husband. She'll go to Rhode Island at first, but eventually her followers will found New Hampshire. All right, third problem for the Puritans, foreign interference. They very much would like to do their own thing. Remember there, the first, you know, um, Calvinists in New England are the pilgrims who were trying to completely separate from England. So the fact that you now have the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the king interfering is not great. By the 1680s, the colonies were profitable and arrogant. Um, and so um, they're flourishing, they're making a lot of money, there's a lot of people. So the UK decides to reorganize. He, uh, the king decides to make this the dominion of New England. He's trying to control loyalty, increase profit. So basically, all of the territory from Canada to New York will be governed by one governor, Edmund Andros. And it is a complete failure. It's a short-lived experiment. Um, they try to control a lot of land, implement custom rules, and both Andros and King James II are simply too autocratic, right? Andros is gonna have to escape New England dressed as an elderly woman, right? They are coming for his head. And then things change in 1688 with the glorious revolution um, with King James II being removed from power. All right, I know this is a lot. Um, I know this is longer than the one on the Chesapeake's, but it's, it's important. So thank you for sticking with me so far. We're gonna talk about the um, New England economy a little bit. If you've ever been to New England, you would know that it is not the easiest landscape to live in. Um, it's not like the Chesapeake region or when we get down south um, or we start talking about Pennsylvania and gosh, South Carolina, like this is land you can farm. New England has long cold winters. It is densely forested. 
the soil is rocky and it is difficult to survive. So they quickly realize we're not gonna be doing any cash crops here. We're not setting up plantations here. Instead, they're gonna be much more industrious. If you know anything about U.S. history, you should be like, oh, I see a connection. Because by the time we get to the mid 19th century in the Civil War, we're gonna start seeing the North is being very industrial. Lots more factories, lots more industry. And the South is gonna be more agricultural. We're already seeing this pattern being laid in the 17th century. We're seeing that the geography of New England is going to lend itself towards trade and industry much more than agriculture. They're gonna be merchants. They will be fishing cod, right? You might have heard of Cape Cod. Um, they will be cutting down trees. Um, we will see that they have a lot of shipbuilding. Um, they're going to be major part of the um, traders that T-R-A-D-E-R, um, who are um, shipping goods back to England. Now, Puritans aren't supposed to be greedy, right? If you are living in a way that honors God, well, you know, um, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. On the other hand, if the money's there to be made, right? Protestant, worth ethic, Protestant work ethic, God's rewarding them for their faithfulness, right? They will refer to this as the serpent of prosperity. It's, it's hard because profit produces temptation, right? They the colonies will participate in triangle trade. The colonies send raw materials to Europe. Europe says, sends raw material or manufactured goods, right? They take that raw material, they make stuff out of it. They'll sell those goods back to the colonies and to Africa. And then Africa will sell slaves to the West Indies. All right, some other New England colonies. Um, Thomas Hooker will found Connecticut of territory that had been part of Rhode Island in 1635. We've already talked about how New Hampshire will be formed in 1679, and then Maine um, will be formed in 1623. Hooker um, essentially gets its start as a squatter colony, right? They just are like, we're here, we're our own colony. And eventually they're like, all right. They settled in this area um, around Hartford. And um, we see that Connecticut had more expansive voting rights than Massachusetts. Okay, so there's a great crash course on colonizing America, right? The true story of Thanksgiving and all that jazz. It's, it's helpful to view, um, just get another interpretation. So that's it for us for today. I know it's a long day, but I hope the depth in which I went will give you a better understanding of Puritans and why this specific group of people are significant to American history. So for your summary, I would like you to explain how and why environmental and other factors shaped the development and expansion of the New England colonies. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please ask. Have a great day.